Hi, my name is Andy, and this is a video about Elm. Uh, Elm is a front-end programming language, as in it runs in a web browser. Uh, what, what you actually do is um, you write the code to compile it, it compiles into a .js file that, get, that you then include in your uh, web, in your HTML page. Uh, it can either take over the whole of your HTML page or a part of it. Um, Elm is really cool, it's really fun. Um, and it makes me feel good because when I come back to my code later, uh, it's not a mystery and I can quickly get on with stuff. And also, it just takes all the uncertainty and things happening in any order and you just don't know what's going on and you get, uh, you get lost in the complexity that I find uh, I end up with when I'm writing JavaScript. Um, so it's really transformed how I feel about writing cool user interfaces um, because the structure that it imposes on your program is a really good structure that saves you from uh, the pain of um, random events happening at random times. Um, I'm going to try and explain that structure a tiny bit in this video, but I'm basically going to give you a, a feeling about um, why Elm makes me feel good, why I like writing code in it. Um, and then there'll be other videos where we go into details about how, it, how exactly how it works. So this is sort of just an advert for Elm. Okay, so reasons why Elm makes me happy. Um, it's very immediate. It, um, you get quick feedback um, and it feels like you can just jump in and see something on the screen very quickly. Um, it's very clean. It, um, it separates things um, that shouldn't be mixed together and it totally enforces that so you can't get away from it. Um, it's extremely frustrating. It has a syntax that when I started with it I wasn't at all familiar with, so the way you write code, um, totally different from what I'd done before. Uh, it's also very strict about qu uh, quite a few things, especially about the types of things. Um, and it's, it's not always easy to figure out how to make the compiler tell you you've done it right. You've always done something wrong, uh, and the compiler's telling you you've done something wrong, but it's not always easy to um, figure out exactly what you have done wrong and make it right, especially when you're not familiar with the syntax. Uh, but it, when you do get it right, um, you feel really good about your program. You feel like you've written really good code. So it's very rewarding. So let's start off with immediate. So here's a little Elm program. It's a little button. It says foo, and when I click on it, um, it reverses uh, the, the text on that button. Um, so the, this program here that you can see is the whole of the code of that Elm program, except for a couple of imports. Um, I'm not going to go into the details about exactly how it works because in order to make it fit on this slide uh, and look really small, I had to do some things that are slightly hard to understand. But what I will say is um, it shows you exactly the structure of an Elm program, which is how it has an init, uh, as in something that sets up things at the start, and then an update, which is um, uh, gets called whenever something changes, and then a view, which tells... Uh, Elm, how to display um, the data, or how to display something on the screen. Um, so it's built out of a model which gets created in init, and then an update and a view. And we'll get into that a bit more. So another way in which it's immediate is it has um, an interactive environment. So if you just type Elm space REPL once you've got Elm installed, R-E-P-L, um, that was an in little interactive environment, which is traditionally called a REPL. Um, so then you can type stuff in and you can see what it does. So that's not that useful for doing sums, maybe, um, but it is useful for finding out what type of thing something is when you're getting stuck on things like that. Uh, and it's just a really immediate way of um, um, figuring out the language a bit. So here we can type in 3 plus 5 and we get the answer 8, and it tells you what type of thing it is, which is a number. Or we can type in a string, hello, and it'll tell you, yep, this is a string. Um, also, you can define, you can put um, things inside names. So here we're saying put the number three inside the name X. Um, and then we can say X plus two. Uh, and it gives us the answer five, which is a number. Um, so the, that, that three got stored inside that X. So that's pretty much how you might expect things to be if you're used to other programming languages. Uh, exact, how you define functions uh, is probably not exactly how you expect if you're used to a language like JavaScript or Java or C++ or Python or Ruby or something like that. This is how you define a function, and um, in later videos I'll I'll go into a lot of detail about how this really works, but for now I just want you to understand 
Um, you're still doing something equals something, even when you're defining a function, uh, which is rather nice, you know, because really defining a function is a bit like defining a variable. Uh, you can store a function in a variable. It kind of is a variable, right? So anyway, um, so here we're defining a function called double, and we're saying it takes in one argument, which is called y, uh, and then on the right-hand side, we're saying that's the body of the function. So the return value of that function is y times 2. Um, and you'll notice that there's no, it doesn't say return or anything like that. Um, but Elm is a pure functional language. Uh, so that essentially means that there's, there's only one line in each function, which is just the return. Uh, like uh, functions don't do stuff to other things. They only calculate a value and return it. Um, that's one of the coolest things about Elm. Uh, but it's also one of the things that's hardest to get your head around when you get into it. Hence the thing I said about frustrating. Anyway, so once we've defined this function called double, uh, in, the, in the bottom bit, we're calling that function, passing in 4, and we get back the answer 8. So that's how you call a function in Elm. You just write its name, and then you write its arguments separated by spaces. There's no brackets or commas uh, needed just to call a function. You use brackets to kind of group things together. Uh, uh, and yeah, so you can see that even though this looks quite straightforward like this, it's actually quite different from languages you might be used to. Anyway, we, uh, th my, this section is about how immediate Elm is. So look, here, here we made some code and we ran it and it worked. Uh, we can define a function called sum of squares, takes in two arguments a and b, and the answer is just a squared plus b squared. And that's how you write squared in Elm, by the way. And then when we call the function sum of squares, I pass in the arguments 3 and 4, notice they're just separated by spaces again, uh, you get back the answer 25, which is right. Um, so here's a little program I wrote for you. Um, uh, which is the kind of program that you would have seen quite a lot of if you were around for Web 1.0. Uh, and I think it's still funny. Um, so this is a little Elm programming running inside of our web page here. Um, and below you can see part of the program that, that uh, part of the code that makes that happen. Um, so this is the model part. So remember I said an Elm program is always built out of a model, an, a view, and an update. So the model is basically the structure of data that gets used um, to make your program work. And anything, any data that you care about, anything that might change or stick around for a long time, it has to be in the model. You can't cheat and stick it in a global variable and do it later. Um, it has to be in the model. So um, uh, here's the model for this program. Basically, it's the x and y position of the mouse. And then it's the x and y position that the program considers to be kind of the center of the screen or the center of where the eyes might look at. Um, so I don't know whether that's the best way to structure this program. It seemed to work. Uh, certainly you're going to need an x and a y, however you structure it. Um, so that was the model. That's like all the data or the information that um, is used to make that program work. Uh, you have to define that really clearly inside the model. And that's really helpful for thinking clearly about exactly what your program does. Uh, and then also in each program you're going to need a view function. So this is an example. This is the view function, part of the view function from um, the, the googly eyes program we just saw. So the view function takes in a model which is called m here. So that's the argument being passed into the view function. And what it returns is a representation of the HTML we want to display on the screen. So here we're just seeing a snippet of the HTML which is actually um, a bit of SVG, so it's that uh, the image with the eyeball and the uh, the white of the eye displayed. Um, uh, and you can see that this um, it isn't HTML or, X or an SVG, um, but it, it sort of looks a bit like it. So you can see the width and the height are, are like the attributes of width and height on an SVG tag in SVG. And then there's an inside that SVG tag, there's an ellipse tag. And if you're familiar with SVG, you'll see that that's CX and CY. Those are the attribute names that you would use if you were making an ellipse in SVG. So, um, yeah, it's similar for HTML. So it would be tag name and then the square bracket um, for the attributes. So that's a list and then a list of all the things that are inside that tag. So what we're doing in the view function is basically returning a representation of the HTML and the SVG or something else that we want to display on the screen. Um, and like a lot of JavaScript frameworks, this doesn't get just get translated into tell the browser to build this DOM structure. 
what Elm does is it runs the view function and finds out what you want the HTML to look like. And then it compares that with the last time it ran the view function uh, and sees whether anything changed or what changed. And, and it just tells the browser to update the stuff that changed. Uh, and that's the way several JavaScript frameworks do it as well. Um, because it's much, much faster. You get much um, more responsive, um, user interface if you just tell the browser the little bits you want to change. Uh, it works well. Uh, with Elm, you can produce nice responsive programs. Um, but it means that you can think. You don't have to think about, oh, what was, what was this like before? Do I need to change it to something else? You just say, oh, this, here's how the screen should look at this moment. Um, this is actually similar to the way, uh, like a 3D game will render. So it definitely can be performant. Um, uh, a game will say, this is what the world should look like. And then a separate part of that game program will then render the, the things that need to change on the screen based on that. Um, so that was, so we've done the model, which is the data of the program. We've done the view, which is what, what do I want the web page to look like given that the model looks like this? And then update is, um, how do you want the model to change when something happened? So in the program that we were looking at with the eyes, uh, there's only one type of thing that can happen, which we're calling here a mouse change. Uh, and it has an X and a Y coordinate to say the mouse changed to this. So the update function takes in that, that X and that Y and that model. And what it returns is a new model. So it doesn't change the model. It returns a new model, which is different. Um, and then Elm knows to actually change the browser. Well, sorry, no. And then Elm knows that that's, that's what your model looks like now. So when it calls view, it'll pass that new model in. Um, so what you're looking at between the squiggly brackets, and we won't get into too much detail here about exactly how it works, um, but between the squiggly brackets there, uh, what that is is a, uh, a way of saying, I want, I want a model that looks like a model, but then that pipe symbol means, but change it in the following way. So change its x its value of x to be x, as in where the mouse moved to, and its value of y to be y, as in where the y coordinate of the mouse moved to. And you can also see that near the bottom there's that cums.none. So the other thing that the update function does, apart from tell it, tell Elm what the new version of model should be, is it also says, um, and also I want you to do these jobs for me. So a job might be something like go off and talk to a bit of JavaScript code, because Elm will integrate nicely with JavaScript code in that way. Um, or it might be go and make a, an HTTP request, and when the response comes back, call the update function saying, oh, the HTTP request returned, here's the answer. Um, so that's the way you interact with the outside world in Elm. You don't, um, you wouldn't make an HTTP request just inside the middle of your view function or inside the middle of your update function. What you would do is you'd pass back a command, like, like we're doing here, except here we're saying don't do anything. Um, uh, what you would do is pass back a command that says, please make this HTTP request for me, and then get back to me uh, when you're done. Uh, so yeah, Elm is very immediate. Um, you can see that we've written some tiny little programs there that um, um, quickly you can see stuff happening on the screen and also you can type stuff into the interactive environment and see how it works. Uh, another way in which Elm is immediate is it's very quick for you to get up and running uh, within a new program. Here's some commands you could type on Linux. So first of all, the, on the top line, you just um, install Node.js and NPM. And the only reason you're installing NPM is because you, uh, that's the way you install Elm. So the next line says NPM install minus G Elm, which means basically give me, give me Elm using the NPM package manager. Then on the line below, um, I'm making a directory, changing into that directory and then calling this command Elm init. And Elm init just means set me up a new Elm project. And I'm piping echo into it just to say, uh, when it asks, are you sure you want to do this? I, I can just say yes by piping that echo in. So basically make a new directory, uh, run elm init. And then the next bit down, I'm actually making a file called main.elm in the source directory. Elm init made us that source directory. Um, so this is just a fancy schmancy way of me saying that the contents of that file should be import HTML and main equals HTML.txt hello. So that is the hello world program in elm, basically. Um, so We've made a directory, changed into it, called elm init, made a file called main.elm, and then we can just run this command, elm reactor. What that does is um, launches a little web server on your own computer in that directory. And then if you go uh, using your web browser, like Firefox, for example, to localhost colon 8000, 
um, then Elm Reactor will show you a little web page there showing you what Elm files you've got. If you click on one of those Elm files or if you go directly to a URL like this, um, uh, which is the location of an actual Elm file, then Elm Reactor will compile that file for you right there and then display the results. And as you can see, um, I've shown you a little picture of what the web browser looks like when you do that. It says hello because you've written a hello a program that writes hello. Um, so it's it's that quick to get an Elm program up and running on your computer. Uh, that's the point of that slide. Okay, so uh, Elm is immediate because you can quickly see stuff in your web browser. It feels a little bit to me like when I first learned how to program in very simple uh, programming languages where um, I would very quickly print something on the screen. Um, so yeah, it's fun for that reason. Uh, and quick to kind of immediately get into. Uh, it's also very clean. And I'm going to use this example to try and explain to you the kind of mess you get into in JavaScript um, or something else that works on a similar model uh, with events and things bouncing around that Elm makes a lot easier to think about. So here's a little program, example program. It asks you to write your email and then it asks you to write it in again. Um, so let's uh, type something in. So let's type not an email. So, so some things have happened. So what happened was um, it's looked at that email that we that email address that we've typed in and it's put a little X to the right hand side saying, well that's not an email address. Um, and it's using extremely sophisticated rules to tell you that's not an email address. Um, the rule is if it's got an at in it, then it is an email address. But you can imagine we might have uh, more helpful rules than that, although actually validating a valid HTML. A valid email address is fairly complicated, so maybe you should steer away from that. Anyway, it's an example. It's an example. Um, and you can see that what's also happened is that the second box has got an X in it, telling you um, that the, the two email addresses you've typed in don't match. So let's type that in again. And when, we, when they match, um, a little tick appears next to that box. And also, the Submit button became enabled. Did you notice that? Um, if I take uh, take away the M so they don't match, the submit button's disabled. If I put it back in again, the submit button is enabled. So that's uh, an example of a kind of um, nicely dynamic uh, bit of uh, front-end web programming that you might write. And this is exactly the kind of thing where if you write this in JavaScript, you could end up with weird stuff happening. So for example, um, maybe the green tick appears, but the submit button doesn't become enabled. And I, we've probably all used web pages where something weird like that happens, and you have to fiddle around a bit, um, and then eventually the right button does get enabled or something like that. So um, the thing about Elm that is really cool is that it's basically impossible to make the kind of bug I just described. Uh, unless, you, unless you do something really sort of obviously wrong, uh, you won't end up with bugs like that. And the reason is it completely separates out the um, the the actual underlying model from the representation of that model on the screen. So you never end up with, um, if, uh, and it also separates out things that happen, so that they happen one at a time in a very clearly and well de well defined way. So you never get something like where an event happened that meant that I, I I did the green tick, but somehow another event arrived in the middle, which meant that the submit button got disabled. Um, maybe the events happened in the wrong order, so now, um, so we, I wasn't expecting to get that event at that time, so I just disabled the submit button in that second event. Yeah, well, all, that, all that kind of stuff that can happen in in a sort of uh, what I now think of as a sort of chaotic event-driven code. The way Elm is structured, it basically prevents that that kind of thing from ever happening. And once you get used to that, it's just so nice. Um, and you get away from this feeling that I always have with a JavaScript program that uh, it was nice when I started, but you know, once I'm more than an hour or two into coding it, I can't remember how any of it works, and it's all held together with string and sellotape. So um, how, how is it clean? How does this work? Well, as I've been saying, it, it works because of this structure that it has, where there's a, a thing called model, which is a representation of all the uh, everything it kind of knows about, all the data in the world. Um, and then there's a function called view which uh, represents that model as HTML and there's a function called update which changes the model or rather make returns a new version of the model 
whenever something interesting happens. And those things are completely separated from each other. And because Elm uh, strongly enforces um, the functional programming paradigm that it uses, which, by the way, in later videos we'll get into what, what that really means and how on earth do you write code if you can't ever change stuff or do stuff. Um, but yeah, because Elm strictly enforces those rules, it's impossible for us to cheat and accidentally update the model a little bit in the view and think, oh, well, I'll fix that later and then never get back to it and then uh, disaster and you can't do anything because no one knows how any of the code works. So, uh, do I sound bitter? Um, so, uh, yeah, so the... Uh, uh, here's an example of a model. The second example we've seen, this is the model for the email program we were just looking at. So you can see it's really simple. It's just got two um, uh, values in it, the email number one and email number two. Notice, by the way, it hasn't got anything about is the submit button enabled or anything like that. You can tell whether the submit button should be enabled based on the two email addresses. So you don't represent that in the model. Um, and that's why you can't get it wrong, if you see what I mean. So that was the model. Here's a little bit of the view. So there's a bit of stuff. And then um, uh, at one point we're returning a div. Inside that div is a button. And um, the decision on whether that button, so this is the submit button, the decision on whether that button should be disabled is made by calling a function called submit disabled model. And what submit disabled actually does is it returns an HTML attribute which will either say disabled equals true or disabled equals false. So the decision about whether to enable um, that button is is made in this function submit disabled based on the model. So we pass in the model. Remember the model has those two email addresses in it. So here's the submit disabled function, takes in a model and it returns disabled, which is basically an HTML attribute um, or the kind of a, the, the Elm representation of an HTML attribute. Uh, and then the whole of the rest of this code is is a single expression, which is basically true or false, going to come out as true or false for, is this button disabled? Um, and the way it makes that decision is it calls two more functions, valid email one and valid email two, and both of those take in the model, and they return something. They either return, um, they return one of several things. One of those things it can return is this thing valid. So if both email one and email two return valid, um, if valid email one and valid email two both return valid, well then the, um, sorry, unless, unless both of them return valid, um, the button will be disabled. So we're just doing a little bit of Boolean logic here. The thing to, um, really take in from this is not the details of how this code works, but the decision about whether to enable the submit button is not made based on, oh, something changed to so a better flipper flag. It's based on, is the model valid? Are the two email addresses both valid? If so, the submit button is valid. So it's based on the model, not on the order of stuff happening behind the scenes. So we've done the model, we've done the view, let's do the update. So the update function will always have, going along with it, um, a, a type, which is normally called MSG, which is what could happen. So the two things that could happen in this program are that email one changed or email two changed. And in each case, um, if email one changes, it will set, it will tell you what it changed to as well. So that's why it says email one changed string and email two changed string there because it comes along with a string. Okay. And then there's the update function. The update function takes two arguments, the message and the model. And then it does what looks like a bit like a switch statement to people who know what that means. Uh, called a case statement. So it basically says if message is email one changed, do this. Otherwise, if it's e if email two changed, it's this. And in both cases, again, we're changing model using that pipe symbol. We're setting email one to be the, what, what email one changed to. Or in the bottom bit, we're setting email two to be what email two changed to. So you can see the update function in this program is incredibly simple. All it does is make sure that the, t that the email that we, um, the, the model that we've got re correctly represents what email one and email two now are because they changed. Um, so um, the model is really simple, just two email addresses. And the update's really simple, just update the email addresses when they change. All the magic happens inside view and view just decides what ticks to display and what and how, whether or not the submit button is enabled based on the two email addresses. So we can't get messed up. We can't have things happen out of order all kinds of strange stuff happen. 
we can't accidentally have a bit of extra state, which is like, is the submit button enabled right now? Because there is no state representing that. Model doesn't even have any idea about a submit button in it. Um, that's all done in a view, which says uh, says how to display two email addresses. So uh, a lot of the pain of um, that kind of event-driven uh, programming is just gone from Elm. Uh, it feels really good. Because everything that you could possibly care about in the world, all the data you could care about, is in the model. Everything you can see or everything that um, that needs to happen in order to be able to see what that model looks like is done in the view. And everything that can possibly happen is handled in update. And nothing happens in the other functions. Uh, so there's no more guesswork about what order things are happening or... Um, um, what might happen if some unexpected stuff happens? Or there's a weird delay or you know, something like that. Um, so Elm is immediate. Elm is clean. Elm is also pretty frustrating, especially when you're getting started. Um, the syntax uh, is confusing uh, if you're not used to it. It's, there are really good reasons why the syntax looks how it looks. Um, it's very, very powerful and cool. But if you're not used to it, it's just crazy you just can't figure it out um, so for example you're going to get you're going to see this error fairly frequently where you think you've passed in one argument to a function uh, actually you've passed in like 10 because you forgot that um, you need to put brackets around something if it's going to be passed as an argument into another function uh, so you're going to see a fair bit of that you're going to see maybe something like this um, basically saying the types that you thought you were passing um, are not the types you really are passing um, and you're going to get confused and maybe you'll see an argument like this where we've got this great big long uh, type error saying um, yeah saying you you passed in a, a, a thing of this type um, but the type you should have passed was this but actually because elms elm represents types in a very flexible and nested way so that a type can actually be this type and this type and this type um, you can get, you can end up with quite complicated types being passed around, and then if you make a typo or forget or don't really remember what type of thing something is, or haven't broken your program down into small enough parts where it's clear where the types are, you're going to get a great big error like this saying, "You, you passed me one of these, but I needed one of these." Um, if you've only programmed in JavaScript, the this type model is going to be really confusing to you because in JavaScript it's really hard to know what type anything is and things can magically change from being a string to an integer without you noticing and stuff like that. Elm will not let you do any of that kind of thing. Um, you need to be really clear. Uh, this is an integer, this is a string, or this is a record with these properties in it, update view, for example. Um, so it's going to be really frustrating. But uh, as I said earlier, the compiler is actually always right. If you've made an error like this, it's because you actually got something wrong. And in a language which isn't as clear about what type of thing you're passing around, uh, you wouldn't find out about getting that thing wrong until something unexpected happened later. Maybe then it said uh, the undefined doesn't have this property name or, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, in Elm, you don't ever see errors like that um, because it's always dealing with the type of thing it thought it was dealing with. And you've always said what that type of thing, what properties that type of thing has. Um, and you're not allowed to kind of break that rule. So you don't get those mysterious errors, but in exchange, you get a whole load of pain um, at, at this point before your program compiles. And you're like, oh, I don't know what this is, but eventually you figure it out. Uh, and uh, it becomes clear to you that actually you were just doing something wrong. Um, this, uh, this is probably the point at which to say this syntax that we're looking at here and the, and the kind of basic structure of the type system uh, is something that uh, it is modelled on what you get in Haskell. And Haskell is a language um, uh, which is pure functional and really totally cool, um, but totally terrifying to someone who is not um, familiar, especially with its syntax. What Elm has is all the hard bits of Haskell are left out. And also, you'll notice even though these error messages are pretty scary, You'll notice that the compiler is really trying to help you. It's printing out your own code here and stuff like that. 
um, in exactly the way you formatted it with line numbers, so it's pointing at the bit of the code that went wrong. It's trying to explain what to do. Uh, so often the error message will say, uh, if you want to learn more about this, go to this URL, stuff like that. So a lot of work has been done to make the Elm compiler really friendly. And I think that's a reaction to the fact that often when people first try and learn Haskell, uh, they find it utterly terrifying and they find the error messages from the compiler incomprehensible and terrifying. Uh, and maybe they give up. Um, so Elm is really doing its best to be much easier to pick up than that. And in my experience, it is much easier. When I did Elm, I'd tried, I'd written a couple of Haskell programs, but I felt, I felt very, very intimidated by it. And actually, by writing Elm, I feel a lot less scared now of the idea of writing a Haskell program, because the basics of the syntax uh, and the way you have to approach problems, I've learned from Elm. So now I can get go back to Haskell with a lot more confidence and maybe deal with the more advanced concepts that are in Haskell that they that have been left out from Elm um, because they they feel that it's not needed for front-end web development. Maybe they're right. Anyway, um, so one of the really cool reasons to try Elm uh, is as a much more friendly way um, of learning this kind of syntax and this kind of functional programming than certainly than I found Haskell to be. Um, but yeah, it can be really frustrating and you really feel like I have no idea why this doesn't work, but keep going, try and um, read the error messages from the compiler because the compiler is really trying to help you out. Often uh, the clue to what you did wrong is in that compiler error. Not always, but often. So it's frustrating, but then at some point your program compiles. And at that point, uh, the saying with Haskell is once your program compiles, it, it's definitely going to work. Uh, and that, that's my experience in Elm. Once it compiles, it normally does what I wanted it to do. Um, you're going to feel really powerful. Um, uh, it's extremely rewarding to get your program working. Uh, and uh, you're going to feel great when you finally got it compiling. Um, so here's some cool stuff you can do in Elm. Once you get used to the syntax a bit, um, you can start speaking actually in a sort of higher level way. So for, here's, here's some examples. Um, there's this, this function called list.map, which basically applies the function that you give it to all the things in a list. So here we're making a list with list.range 1, 3, which means make a list with 1, 2, and 3 in it. Um, and then we're saying um, run the double function on every item in that list. That's what list.map means. So now we get out the answer 2, 4, 6, because we put in 1, 2, 3. And then similarly below, we're saying um, we're, we're making a list one two three explicitly below, and we're saying list dot map, and then we're providing a lambda function. Now most people are, know what a lambda function is if they've done work in other languages recently. A lambda function just means an anonymous function, so a function that we're writing right there and then in the middle of the page, and without bothering to give it a name. In Elm, a lambda function start with that backslash. So we're basically saying a function that takes in x and squares it. So when we apply that to every element of the list, we get one, four, nine. So it squared everything in the list. Um, so you can see already that's quite powerful. You can do things um, quite naturally. But then let's look at some some of the stuff that really I think is really cool about Elm, which is that you can speak at a higher level. Uh, and what I mean by that is you can give a name to a concept, uh, even if that concept is the kind of thing that in other languages you can't really name, can't do anything about. So try and explain what I mean. So here we've got a function called do twice and it takes in as an argument a function. Uh, and we've seen that already with the list.map also takes in a function as an argument. Um, so what do twice does is given a value x, um, it applies the function fun to x, i.e. calls, calls fun, fun, passes in x as the argument, and then when the answer comes back it calls fun again on the answer. Um, now it won't. This won't compile if um, if that doesn't work. But it, for a function like double, that does work because you can. If the answer to double four comes back as eight, well then you can double that again. So here's an example of what uh, of us doing that. We call do twice. We pass in two arguments. We pass in the double function and we pass in four. And what do twice does is calls the double function twice and get back um, four double twice, which is sixteen. So that was all just preamble for us being able to name stuff. So here we can name, we can, we can say that the action of doing double twice should itself get a name. And we're going to call it double twice. 
right? So now when we now we've got a function called double twice, which takes in four and returns sixteen. So that's just a really cut down example of the kind of sort of higher level concept um, that you can represent really nicely and easily in this syntax in this language. Um, so here, double twice is this concept that we've now been able to give a name to. We don't have to think about how it's implemented anymore. It's just twice doubling that number. Um, when you get into um, writing code in that kind of way, uh, whenever you find yourself retyping some code that looks the same as something else, you start thinking, ooh, I wonder whether this is actually a concept I can give a name to. And in contrast to in some other languages I've worked with, in Elm, the answer is normally yes. Uh, and in a way that works. So what you get for the kind of for pushing through the pain of learning how to use this compiler that is really strict with you and learning how to use this functional programming paradigm where you're not allowed to change stuff, you can only return stuff, is you get clarity. You get clarity about what order stuff's happening, you get clarity about which bit of code has which job, you know, view and update are completely separate and different. You get control, especially you get control of what am I doing right now. Um, I'm not just um, responding to an event and maybe another event happens when I'm not expecting it. Um, actually, the uh, the things, the, up, the calls to update happen one at a time. So the Elm runtime figures out things in such a way that uh, it will call update saying this changed and then later it will call update saying this other thing changed. Uh, there's no confusion. You feel in control. You feel confident. Um, I found, I've been, I worked on some, some Elm code a couple of years ago. I came back to it. In the last few weeks, I wanted to change it, add a few buttons here and there, make things work differently. Um, I was amazed at how quickly I got started making functional changes, and they work straight away, or much more quickly than I'm used to when I get back into a code base I've forgotten about. Um, yeah, so it really gives you confidence because all the all the type, uh, all that type checking, which is so annoying, um, if you don't understand what it's telling you, you've done wrong. When you make a quick little change, you change the type of something. The compiler will tell you all the other places you need to change for you, um, so you can't mess you can't mess it up and forget one, and that really gives you confidence. Also, you get power like the kind of expressive power that I was just talking about, which I think, um, if this is the first time you've seen this type of stuff, it's going to take a while before you agree with me that that's really cool and powerful. But um, stick with it. You're going to feel uh, like you've got more ways of expressing yourself, and you can express higher level concepts. Uh, once you've got all that stuff, um, I can't guarantee you happiness, but um, certainly it's a lot of fun to play with Elm. Um, so I hope that was a, a, of some interest. Um, this was the second time I've made this video because Elm's changed a bit since the last time, so this was based on Elm 0 0.19. Um, have a go with Elm. Um, uh, write a comment if you've got questions or things that you would like me to make a video about. Uh, feel free to donate money on Patreon. I uh, try out my game, Rabbit Escape, look at more videos on YouTube slash AJ Balaam, read my blog at artificialworlds.net slash blog, look at all the open source projects and um, stuff I've written and all the stuff stuff about me on artificialworlds.net. You can follow me on Twitter or even better, follow me on mastodon.social, which is like an alternative to Twitter that's not run by um, one profit-making entity. Uh, check out my code on GitHub. Um, and presumably at some point coming soon, updated versions of um, videos about uh, a bit more in depth about how to code in Elm uh, based on a recent version of Elm. Uh, let me know what you'd like to find out about, what confuses you. And I'll see you next time.